Welcome to worship this morning for Epworth United Methodist Church in Berkeley, California. I'm Pastor Kristen Stone King and so grateful that you have found your way here this morning. I know that God has beckoned you here for a reason and I pray that this will be a meaningful service of worship for you today. We know that people are joining from around the Bay Area, from around the country, and even from around the world. Welcome. Today, after the worship service, we in the virtual coffee hour, to which everyone is invited, we will be celebrating October birthdays and anniversaries. The link to get to the virtual coffee hour is in the, uh, the chat if you're watching on Facebook Live or is in the email reminder that comes out on Saturday. If you're not receiving those reminders, I want to invite you, invite you to, to fill out one of our Connect cards. You can find the link also on Facebook Live at the top of the chat. Uh, or you can also just go to this address, epworthberkeley.org backslash connect, and that will get you in the loop of all of the, of the communications and knowing what's happening in this vibrant community of faith. One of the ministries of Epworth that you may not be aware of is our older adult ministries program, or A plus ministries. Um, this program is relatively new, about three or four years old, and led by our wonderful director of children, family, and older adult ministries, Susan Jarden. One of the offerings of this of A plus is a monthly gathering for lunch uh, with an invited guest speaker. This week is the Lunch Bunch, as it's called, and the speaker is Katherine Robinson. She's a yoga instructor, and her talk is entitled Breath as Anchor, Finding Refuge in Our Bodies in Times of Trouble. So if you consider yourself an older adult, you are warmly welcomed to join that gathering on Zoom. Uh, and again, the link is in our communications that come out on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. Please make sure that you are getting those by signing the Connect card, and I hope that you'll gather with the Lunch Munch this Thursday if you're an older adult. Today we are taking a special offering to support our Sanctuary Action Ministry. This is the ministry of the church that works with persons who are fleeing violence in their home country. And part of that ministry for Epworth is accompanying families, and we are accompanying currently several families. And so during the offering time, you're invited to make a special gift. You can do that either by sending a check to Epworth at 1953 Hopkins Street, Berkeley, California, 94707, with Sanctuary Action in the memo, or you can do it online at epworthberkeley.org backslash donate. And now let us worship. As the scriptures are read and God's word proclaimed, let us hear with joy what God has to say to us today. Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin to build a world where love can grow and hope.
Good morning. My name is Clark Milsom, and I am a member of the church, and I've been asked to read the call to worship, which is as follows. In likeness with the creator and lover of all life, who yearns for the flourishing of all, we are unsettled, upset, grief-stricken, and incensed. The preciousness of life is treated, treated with contempt. Daily we weep over evil's reign. For every sibling, kin, and stranger neglected or exploited, God let our righteous fury move us to respond. My name is Mayland Yokla and I am a member of the Epworth Youth Group. This is 2 James 1 to 9. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Good morning. The Apostle James calls on us as followers of Jesus to live what we say we believe. When we say that we love our neighbors as ourselves, we need to mean it and to live it every day. Who are some of the people who can help us understand what living our beliefs can look like? One is American author, professor, and historian on race, Ibram X. Kendi. He recently wrote a children's book called Anti-Racist Baby. Anti-Racist Baby is bred, not born. Anti-Racist Baby is raised to make society transform. Babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There's no neutrality. Take these nine steps to make equality a reality. Number one. Open your eyes to all skin colors. Anti-racist baby learns all the colors, not because race is true. If you claim to be colorblind, you're denying what's right in front of you. Number two, use your words to talk about race. No one will see racism if we only stay silent. If we don't name racism, it won't stop being so violent. Number three, Point at policies as the problem, not people. Some people get more while others get less because policies don't always grant equal access. Number four, there's nothing wrong with people. Even though all races are not treated the same, we are all human, anti-racist baby can proclaim. Number five, Celebrate our differences. Anti-racist baby doesn't see certain groups as better or worse. Anti-racist baby loves the world that's truly diverse. Number six, knock down the stack of cultural blocks. Anti-racist baby appreciates how groups speak, dance, and create as they choose. Anti-racist baby welcomes all groups voicing their unique views. Number seven, confess when being racist. 
Nothing disrupts racism more than when we confess the racist ideas that we sometimes express. Number eight, grow to be an anti-racist. Anti-racist baby is always learning, changing, and growing. Anti-racist baby stays curious about all people and isn't all-knowing. Number nine, believe that we shall overcome racism. Anti-racist baby is filled with the power to transcend, my friend, and doesn't judge a book by its cover, but reads until the end. Let's pray together. God of all, you created us all in your image without exception. Through your goodness, open our eyes to see the dignity, beauty, and worth of every human being. Open our minds to understand that we are brothers and sisters in the same human family. Open our hearts to repent of racist attitudes, behaviors, and speech which demean others. Open our ears to hear the cries of those wounded by racial discrimination and their passionate appeals for change. Strengthen our resolve to make amends for past injustices and to right the wrongs of history and fill us with courage that we might seek to heal wounds, build bridges, forgive and be forgiven, and establish peace and equality for all in our communities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Traveling through this world of woe, yet there's no sickness, no toil or danger in that bright world to which I go. I'm going.
Will you pray with me, please? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In August of 2013, I was in Washington, D.C. with my son, John, and my sister-in-law, Kim, preparing to speak at the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. The day before the event, speakers were required to go to the headquarters of the National Council of Negro Women to pick up passes for themselves and their guests. So we made our way to the site of the NCNW offices, which sits on Pennsylvania Avenue between the White House and the buildings of Congress. Inside the building, I noticed a bust of Mary McLeod Bethune. I knew Ms. Bethune had been a Methodist and that she was a founder of Methodist-related Bethune Cookman University, one of the most respected of historically black colleges and universities. I knew she had been an educator and reformer, but the breadth of her life's work and achievements were not fully known to me. Mary McLeod Bethune was born in 1875 in South Carolina to parents who had been enslaved. Bethune left South Carolina after high school and went to North Carolina where she graduated from Scotia Seminary. From there, she went on to Chicago to attend Evangelist Dwight Moody's Institute for Foreign and Home Missions. And upon graduation, with no church willing to sponsor her as a missionary, she became an educator. A woman of faith, there was no doubt in her mind that she was called to bring opportunity and equality to black persons and especially to women. In addition to being one of the founders of Bethune-Cookman University in Florida, she founded the National Council of Negro Women, which was the first non-governmental organization to have status at the United Nations. She was vice president of the NAACP from the time she was 65 until her death at age 80. She was a close friend of Eleanor Roosevelt and had the ear of both presidents Roosevelt and Truman being appointed to federal posts by each. In 1974, a statue of her was erected in Washington, D.C.'s Lincoln Park across a courtyard from Lincoln himself. It took no small amount of organize to have the statue of Lincoln turned 180 degrees so that Bethune and Lincoln were face to face rather than having her look at his back for all of eternity. One of Bethune's successors as president of the National Council of Negro Women was Dr. Dorothy Height, who was famously denied the stage at the original March on Washington by the All-Male Organizing Committee. The building where the NCNW is now housed is named the Height Building after her. And this is the building where speakers were told to pick up our tickets. The building that housed the famed organization that Bethune started and that Height also led. It was an interesting choice. When the ticket pickup could have happened in any number of buildings, some much closer to the site of the event at the Lincoln Memorial, the proverbial house that Bethune built was, but was where this important piece of admission was going to be conferred. I have to wonder if this was intentional. The 50th anniversary of the March on Washington was organized by the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolence and Social Change with the lead organizer for the event being Bernice King, executive director of the center and King's youngest daughter. Was Bernice King trying to right a past wrong, saying implicitly, black women were barred from speaking 50 years ago, but today, to even get through the gate, you must pay homage to Dorothy Height and Mary McLeod Bethune. Maybe the women were kept from speaking in 1963, but, but it seemed like Bernice King was saying, 50 years later, if you're gonna speak, you're gonna have to go through the women first. 
Our scripture today from the book of James, which you heard Abby read, is about a kind of gatekeeping that grants access based on symbols of power or place in society. Hear these words from James again. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Bethune was a different kind of gatekeeper. She stood for the door being opened for all people, but she held it wider for those who were disenfranchised, those who were poor, those who experienced the weight of systemic and interpersonal oppression. One of the remarkable things about Mary McLeod Bethune, though she came herself from humble origins, was that she did not ascribe any particular weight or offer additional respect to the many persons of wealth and power with whom she worked and organized. They, like she, were laborers in the fields of the Lord, beloved children of God. Mary McLeod Bethune's authority was not based on wealth or inheritance. Her authority was what we call moral authority. The power with which she spoke was based on absolute confidence in the promises of God, that love was love, and each person's worth is a God-given gift. She enjoyed teaching and spending time with poor black children, fearlessly faced white opponents, and sometimes converted them through a loving welcome, and confidently walked into the White House to advise the president and the first lady. Returning to the scripture, James continues, Listen, my dear siblings, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom of God promised to those who love God? And we see that not only are we to live out a radical equality with respect to all persons, but that in fact, God's priority like Bethune's is for the poor. This can be a hard paradox for the non-poor to accept. Used to having and getting, used to the idea that God loves us all the same, we startle at the idea that God would have a priority for the poor. But it was this paradox that Mary McLeod Bethune understood that not only was no one better than she, but as long as there was social inequality, she had authorization from God to address and eliminate that inequality. As liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez has written, in the Bible, poverty is a scandalous condition, inimical to human dignity, and therefore contrary to the will of God. The tension of this paradox has been present in Methodism from the beginning. John Wesley, the 18th century Anglican priest, felt that the Church of England was too focused on the social hierarchy of the day. He felt that the message of grace and love was not reaching the miners, the laborers, those who worked in the fields. They didn't, he felt that they didn't feel welcome in a church or a parish that expected whether implicitly or explicitly, a level of material wealth expressed in dress and, and custom. And so he went to the fields and the mines and the pubs and preached, inviting all into this radical fellowship of equality and into a crusade to eliminate poverty, social stratification, and other forms of inequality to the glory of God. And out of this moral authority, the Methodist Church was born. Mary McLeod Bethune proceeded in this tradition with this authority, and yet that same Methodist Church, our Methodist Church, still struggled with then and still struggles to this day with the centering of those with status and power. In 1844, the church 
with the founder who had preached abolition of slavery had become conformed to the way of America and could not find the moral authority to maintain the abolitionist struggle with singleness of purpose. The church split into North and South and 60 years later, when talks of reunification began, Mary McLeod Bethune vehemently argued for one unified church. Had we listened to her voice of moral authority, we would be a stronger, more faithful church today. Instead, the central jurisdiction that segregated African American Methodists from white Methodists was created when Northern and Southern Methodists reunited, reunified in the Methodist Episcopal Church. But Mary McLeod Bethune, true to her gift and way of authority, led the Committee on Women's Work of the Methodist Episcopal Church, which was dis determined that organized women in the Methodist Church would be unified across jurisdictional lines. Black women organized for mission would take their rightful place in a single national Methodist women's movement. Until days before her death, Mary McLeod Bethune was serving and organizing for the vision of a world that God gave to us, where the equal worth of all was honored and a preferential option for the poor was advocated for and struggled for until that world was realized. Her last will and testament is an ongoing gift and symbol of her way of authority. Bethune wrote, Sometimes as I sit communing in my study, I feel that death is not far off. I am aware that it will overtake me before the greatest of my dreams. Full equality for black persons in our time is realized. Yet I face that reality without fear or regrets. I am resigned to death as all humans must be at the proper time. Death neither alarms nor frightens one who has had a long career of fruitful toil. The knowledge that my work has been helpful to many fills me with joy and great satisfaction. She went on to say that her worldly possessions were few, but she had deeded her house to the Mary McLeod Bethune Foundation for research, interracial activity, and the sponsorship of educational opportunities. She wrote, so as my life draws to a close, I will pass on to African Americans everywhere in the hope that an old woman's philosophy may give them inspiration. Here then is my legacy. I leave you love. I leave you hope. I leave you the challenge of developing confidence in one another. I leave you a thirst for education. I leave you a respect for the use of power. I leave you faith. I leave you racial dignity. I leave you a desire to live harmoniously with your fellow brothers, sisters, and siblings. I leave you finally a responsibility to our young people. In each of these uh, legacies, she detailed what she meant by that, and I commend her last will and testament to you in the fullness of its wisdom. And then she closed with this. If I have a legacy to leave my people, it is my philosophy of living and serving. As I face tomorrow, I am content, for I think I have spent my life well. I pray now that my philosophy may be helpful to those who share my vision of a world of peace, progress, brotherhood, and love. May we as co-laborers toward the kingdom of God inherit her way of authority and continue pursuing the world she knew was possible. Amen. Right.
We now come to our time of prayer and community to raise the concerns on our hearts in our prayers to God. I invite you to share your prayers, either silently or in voice, where you are and in the group chat if you are joining us live on Facebook. Please remember to only use people's first names. If you're watching at a later time, and have prayer requests, please email prayer at epworthberkeley.org. You may also request prayer or longer-term spiritual accompaniment from a Stephen minister at that same address. After sharing our prayers, we will join our voices in the Lord's Prayer, as Jesus taught us to say regardless of whatever lingers on our hearts. Let us lift our prayers together now.
Good morning. I'm Paul Nassman, a member of Epworth. Each week we bring our offerings to support the work of our church. You can donate online at epworthberkeley.org slash donate or send a check to Epworth United Methodist Church, 1953 Hopkins Street, Berkeley, California, 94707. If you wish to text your donation, see the instructions in the Facebook chat. This is the second Sunday in our stewardship series, Converging Paths, the Way of the Saints. Each week, members of our community will share a thought, an experience, or a personal story about giving. Not only giving in the monetary sense, but also in time, talent, and service. This week, Charles Lynch shares a brief but powerful message about the role of giving in his life, embodied in the gospel song, if I can help somebody. Dr. Martin Luther King used a verse of this song in one of his final sermons. And we'll hear the Bethune-Cookman University Concert Chorale perform. In my relationship with Christ, all I want to do is to let my life be a, uh, uh, instrument and to be a witness for his goodness in my life. There's a song that says, if I can help somebody as I pass this way, then my living won't be in vain. So I just want to be an instrument of God. And, and, and I do that when I go to church and wherever I am, I just let, I want my life to be a testimony. If I can help
Please join me now in prayer. Loving God, accept the gifts of our hands and the thankfulness of our hearts. And let these offerings become a source of hope and love, not only in this church family, but in the community and the world beyond. Amen. Courageous ones, God sends us with the audacity of Christ before thrones of injustice and in the quiet of our hearts, the Spirit enables us to be brave for our own integrity, for our neighbor's well-being, 
for the sake of collective flourishing. With peace that passes all understanding, let us go and live our faith. Amen.